especially when it comes to these special times like the next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans uh, chapter 8. Um, let's see, we're going to start with here. Uh, this is part 3 of this series of messages on how to live a successful Christian life or how to uh, become sanctified uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God. And uh, it's important for us uh, as, we, as we live this life, and I actually make the statement at the beginning this morning, living for Christ uh, is, um, or living the Christian life, is the most important thing we do in our lives. I put on uh, my notes, it is the number one priority of every Christian. It, it's the top. It's the thing that should make our heart tick. It's the thing that should make us excited to get up in the morning. It's living for Christ. Paul states it well in uh, Galatians chapter 2. We've looked at this passage many times, and I encourage you to look at this passage again and again. And if you're doing the daily spiritual checklist, which I do, uh, this is one of the verses that's on my checklist, and I encourage you to put it on yours as well. It's a verse that is, uh, should be uh, guiding us each day. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And since God has called us uh, to um, live for Christ and to allow Christ to live through us, it is important for us to know exactly, exactly what it means to live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God, by the Holy Spirit leading us. It's important, imperative that we learn that. In chapter 7 of the uh, book of Romans, uh, there were uh, some things toward the end of the chapter um, that we uh, were talking about that were really uh, important about living uh, the spiritual life. In chapter 7, we learned these things. I cannot live a Christian life in my own power. And uh, it's in prayer imperative that we remind ourselves of that. The Apostle Paul, throughout the seventh chapter, explains very clearly 18 eyes in the section that deals with I cannot do it, I cannot accomplish it, I cannot uh, live the good things, I cannot do uh, in my own power is the focus. And then the second thing that we talked about in that seventh chapter uh, deals with uh, the fact that I cannot live the Christian life by keeping the law. A big error that's taught, and it's being taught in churches even today, that when you become a believer, what you need to do is to get a hold of the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, the laws of God, and follow them, and you're going to be righteous. And Galatians talks about this. It explains Galatians. Uh, that, uh, that those who begin in faith can you continue uh, in, in keeping the law. law. And, uh, and uh, he, he, he calls the Galatians foolish for seeking uh, to do that. For the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 3, for what the law could not do, and the law cannot make you a spiritual, strong Christian. God did and how does God do it? He does it through the Spirit as he works through you and me. And so the law does not add to our spiritual life. And the third thing we talked about in the uh, chapter 7 in relationship to how to live the Christian life, uh, and how to become mature in Christ, uh, how to become sanctified in him, is the only way that we can do it is through the power of the Holy Spirit moving and working in our lives. And uh, that's really important. We see uh, that he talks about that in verse 24 of chapter 7. He says, wretched, this is his conclusion, 
wretched man that I am. And, and we know all about Paul. He was a, we, we think he was a giant of the faith. But he looks at his life and says, wretched man that I am. Who can free me uh, from this uh, flesh of death, basically is what he says, from this body of death? And then verse 25, thanks be to God. <laughs> What's he thanking God for? It's God who frees us from the law of sin and death and gives us life. And so then he moves to the, set, to the eighth chapter. Uh, he set the case that there's only one way to become the spiritual person God wants you to become, to become the strong Christian God wants us to become. And that is through uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. And so last week we began to talk about this um, as we looked at the beginning of chapter 8 of uh, the book of Romans. We saw three words that are really, really important words. This is in verses 1 through 8. And these words were the word condemnation, uh, used twice in that text. Then the word law, used five times in that text. And then the word mind, uh, used at least uh, four times in that text. And these, the, these words uh, are fundamental uh, to... Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, working in our life to make us the person uh, he wants us to become. In Christ, the word condemnation tells us, when he's looking at the word condemnation, in Christ, uh, in the Spirit, we have freedom from condemnation. And that simply means that we'll never, ever, as believers in Jesus Christ, face the penalty for our sin. We faced it already through the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, he faced it for us. He stared down death for us. He put his hands up on that cross, and his feet and he was nailed to the cross, and he became, he became the penalty of sin for us. He took it. He bore it for us. Amen? And he tells us in that text, we'll never, ever face the penalty of sin for our sin ever because he took it on the cross. And that's wonderful comfort and assurance for us as Christians. That means that we don't have to spend our life fretting and wondering, oh, am I going to be okay with God? Yes, you will be, and you are, because there's no condemnation to those who are, and he says in that text, in Christ. When you become in Christ, that means you've become united with him. You've been made union with him uh, through faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the word law that we focus on in this text. In Christ, we have a new law. And that's what he tells us in chapter 8. He tells us we have a new law. We are no longer, we are no longer subject to the law and the rule of, uh, of sin and the and the law of sin and death. We are under a new rule of God, and that rule is through the Spirit. We have a new uh, law of the Spirit. We have new marching orders, if you will, from God, and it's, it's marching orders of life through the Spirit. And then that third word, the word mind, in Christ we learn to focus our minds through the Holy Spirit on the Spirit of God. And so God wants our minds to be focused on things above and not on things on the earth. We are to live our lives with our minds stayed upon Jehovah. That's how we finished last week's message with that song. Uh, stayed upon Jehovah. And so we have, been, we have been called by God to understand that we are free from condemnation that we um, have a new law to live by, and it's the law of the Spirit, and it's, it's a law that brings life. And death is in the past, folks. It brings life. And then with our minds, we're to focus our minds on God. Stay our mind in, on Jehovah. In addition to those three words, um, part of the work of the Spirit, and I'm kind of, Concluding this again, uh, we have freedom from condemnation. 
we have a new law of life in the spirit. This is me restating it for you. And we have, uh, we are to learn to focus our minds on him. In addition to those three things, the text continues. And it continues in chapter 8, verse 12 and uh, through 13. And what God does, and I'm going to give you this outline, this is what we're going to talk about this morning. What God does, in addition uh, to taking away any condemnation, in addition to giving us a new law, in addition, in addition uh, to, um, I just lost my train of thought, in, in addition to, um, yeah, let's, let's get there, in addition to focusing our minds, see, got to get my mind right this morning. So in addition to no condemnation, in addition to a new law, in addition a rule of life through the Spirit, in addition to focusing our minds on him, in addition to those things, he's given us these three additional um, things that the Holy Spirit does in our life. The Holy Spirit erases our debt to sin. Now, we sang about the debt to sin here just a few minutes ago. Amen? He erases our debt to sin. And he... He gives us a new relationship with him. Oh, that's important. That's important as we talk about that new relationship. And we have a new identity being identified with him. That's what we're going to talk about in this, um, in this study this morning. So God erases our debt to sin. And he says here in chapter 8, verse 12, so then, he's concluding some of his thoughts, so then, brothers and sisters, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Now that word obligation, if you have the King James, it probably has a different word. And it's probably the word debt. And the word debt is actually a preferred word to me, because it's easier for me to understand that I'm in debt as opposed to I have an obligation. When I go to a restaurant, I have an obligation uh, to pay for my food. When, when my bills come each month, I have debts I've got to pay. And uh, so that to me gives a little bit of better understanding of the difference between obligation and debt. And a debt is something that can hang over you. Uh, from the financial world especially, and also from the spiritual world. If you felt that you were in debt uh, to sin and to the law, and a lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that they're still in debt to the law and, and that they've got to do certain things or God's not going to be happy with them. We're not in debt anymore uh, to sin. We're no longer tied to the law as a debtor. We owe nothing to the law. We owe nothing to sin. We've been released from that debt. And so God erases our debt. Your debt to the law was paid in that same place where the Lord Jesus took our sins on the cross. Your debt was paid. And it was paid in full. And you and I are forever, forever free from any debt of the flesh or debt of sin. Since we have no more debt, <laughs> we're debt free. <laughs> Amen. Y'all want to be debt free financially and in this world? Well, you're debt free spiritually. Amen. We should, we should burn something. Isn't that what you do when you become debt free? You've paid off your house. Don't you burn the... We didn't do that, Lori. Uh, but we should have. And we know that other people have done that. They've taken something that they paid off and they got the paid off thing and they just burn it up. Amen. Because it's no longer hanging over your head. And so spiritually, what a testimony. We are debt free. We've been set free from our debt to sin. We can enjoy a new relationship. I don't know about you, but when you have am animus with somebody, when you're upset with somebody, it's hard to sit down and fellowship with them, isn't it? You, you have that issue? You had words with somebody, 
and uh, maybe somebody in your family or maybe even a friend you've had words with or a neighbor, and every time you see them, there's a cloud that comes up over their head, and, <clears throat> and it says, you owe him an apology, <laughs> or something like that, or he's still mad at you. You need to do something. You know what I'm talking about? Well, we don't have any of that hanging over us. We're free. We're free in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can enjoy a new relationship with him. And guess what? God has given us a new relationship. We're debt free. And we're free from sin. And he's given us this new relationship. And I'm going to read to you, uh, beginning in verse 13, and uh, in chapter 8, verse 13, I'm going to read uh, through, I think, at least verse 15. For if you are living in accord with the flesh, you are going to die. If, however, and by the way, some of yours says, but if, uh, take the but out of there. There is a but in there, but it should be if. And uh, don't want to go through all the grammar, but the first word there should be if, uh, therefore as opposed to but if. If, making it uh, a, a potential there, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, uh, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption, as sons and daughters, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. So we have this new uh, relationship with God. And here's the things that are in this new relationship. Uh, we put to death the deeds of the flesh. Now, how do you put the, 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 the Apostle Paul uses in Colossians chapter 4, he says, Mortify, therefore, the members of your body against, and he makes a whole list of sins. Mortify, make it dead. How do you do that? Uh, how do you put to death the deeds of the flesh? Notice the statement, by the Spirit. You see, what, what a lot of people think they do is I'm going to put the deeds of the flesh to death, and so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to follow the commands. I, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to tell any lies. Now, the problem with that is, is that it's going back to that I, and remember, I can't do anything to become all that God wants me to be. I've, I've got to have some help, and it's by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Y'all understand that? Do you catch it just a little bit? I don't think I totally understand it. But I think that that's what the Bible teaches, and, and maybe if we get a hold of that, it really revolutionizes our relationship with our Lord. We, we, can't, we can't do it in our own power, but the deeds of the flesh can only be destroyed as we turn to the Spirit of God. And we say, oh Lord, give me strength not to do that. Oh Lord, give me strength to trust you. Lord, help me to think about other things. Lord, help me. You, you, you understand, and I encourage you to think about that. In this text, he says in verse 13, we put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. The Spirit is the means by which you deal with the issues of your life that are called sin. Amen? And that's what he talks about. And so then the second is, is that in this text, we're called children of God. We're called children of God. We have this new relationship with him. We can now put to death the sins of the, the deeds of the flesh, and we're his children. And we're his children. You know, that's one of the most special relationships of all time. I, I mean, you know, there's no one ever, mamas, daddies, there's no one ever that's going to be closer to you man, you just love them. You just love them. In fact, in fact, you would do anything, anything that, that God would allow you to do to help your children because you love them. And so we are his children. He continues, he says that we are his adopted 
children. That, that's an amazing statement. The world teaches that everybody in the world is a child of God. Wrong. 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 Did I say it was wrong if the world teaches that? Well, the world teaches it, but it's wrong what they teach. Because not everybody is a child of God. Only those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have been placed into Christ. Then you become a child. Of, that's a pretty special relationship. And, and those of us who have become his children, we weren't naturally his kids. How can we be adopted if we were naturally his kids? We can't be, right? We are kids that were born destined for destruction. But he reached down and he says, you know, I want that kid to myself. I want that kid to be my kid. Now, I'm making it simplistic. But that's basically what he did. And what he did is when he, when he took us and made us his children, what he did is he gave us all the rights and the privileges of a natural born son. Who is the natural son of the God of heaven? The Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I, as adopted kids into God's family, God has given us all the rights and the privileges that Jesus has. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? He's going to talk about that in a moment, and we'll, we'll say some more things about it when we get there. And so we've been adopted into his family, and we cry out, Abba, Father, Abba. Now, we all like that word. In fact, we sang it this morning, didn't we? It was Abba, Father, in our song. Did you remember that? Yeah, we did, and that was cool uh, to see that there because I knew we were going to talk about this. That Abba speaks of the most intimate relationship in the entire world. Do you know that word Abba is only used three times in the New Testament? It's only used three times in the New Testament. This is one of the three times where it's used. And one of the times it's used in the life of the Lord Jesus. And the time it was used in the life of the Lord Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord Jesus was preparing to go to the cross in a very few hours. And he took his disciples, two of his disciples, three of his disciples, and he took them into the Garden of Gethsemane with them, and he asked them to pray. And you know the story. And as he was praying, the Lord Jesus Christ was asking the Father if the Father would, would take this cup from him. And in that context, he called the Father. The most intimate name of God in relationship to his children. And so here, the word Abba simply means daddy. Throughout my whole life of ministry, I've, I've heard people say, you know, God is my father. And they'll, I, I, we had a specific friend uh, for many years, she would say, oh, my father has plans for me. Or I'm thinking about my father today. And sometimes I would get confused. Uh, and then I remember, oh, she's talking about God the Father. I've never heard someone go around and say, I love my daddy. Thinking of God. But that really is, is a name that is name that reveals this intimate relationship that we have with him. He is our daddy. We like that, right? How many of you call your ma, your dad daddy? Not very many. Probably. You call your dad daddy? Well, that's really a wonderful thing because that's one of the most special names that you can call your father. Don't call him old man. Okay? Don't call him aged one <laughs> or some other thing that you could call him. Don't call him crippled 
<laughs> whatever, but you call him. Yeah. And there's other terms of endearment with us, but this was in term of endearment with God and with his people. And so here we have this new relationship with him. It's a special relationship. And, and it's part of what we have in relationship is to help us to become the successful Christian that God wants us to be. And not only are we erasing, having our debt erased by God, and not only are we involved in this new relationship with the God of heaven, our daddy, not only do we have that new relationship, God has given us a new life which is identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Read with me in verses 16 and verse 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So God, first of all, he testifies that we belong to him. His spirit testifies to our spirit. And so when, when we belong to him and we have a relationship with him, he gives us peace in our heart. And that's how we know that we belong to him. We have this wonderful peace. We know that, he's, that we have no debt. We know that we're part of his family. And so his spirit, when we understand that truth, there's just this peace that overwhelms you. It overwhelms your heart. And so it's an evidence when we experience this peace from God. His spirit is speaking to our spirit that we are his, that we belong to him, that we are his personal property. Notice as he continues in verse 17, if children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And so we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful thing. Here we are, adopted ones, who have the same uh, connection to God as the Lord Jesus Christ and that we are joint heirs or fellow heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a wonderful blessing it is to have this new identification with him. We're identified uh, as belonging to him. We're identifying as being his heirs. That's a wonderful thing just to think about that. I'm an heir. I'm an heiress. <laughs> I, I'm going to inherit all of this. And the focus isn't that, obviously. The focus is our God. Amen? Uh, but it's a wonderful thing to think about. And then as we as we experience the testimony of the Spirit of God to our spirit, as we experience the fact that we're joint heirs with Jesus, uh, we also will experience the various things that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, experienced in his life. Now, you and I are probably not going to the cross. Some might. Some of the disciples, uh, some of the 12, actually uh, suffered terrible things. Uh, some were actually... Uh, taken and, and hung on crosses, and others were killed in other ways. Um, but uh, we, we don't know. We're not saying that that's how we're going to emulate the experiences of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 15. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were, were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember uh, the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they pers persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. If they, followed my, uh, if they followed my word, they will follow yours also. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. So God has called us to a life of living in him, and living in him, we're going to experience some of the things that he experienced. 
uh, because that's the nature of a servant uh, to the master. The, that's the nature of a son uh, to the father is that you're going to experience some of the things that they experience. You're going to learn some of the things they learn, and you're going to uh, experience some of the things that they experience. So he tells us here in uh, verse uh, 17, he says, And if heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, and then he gives two illustrations, one of suffering and one of glorification. Uh, there's, if, if you suffer with him, so that you may also be glorified in him. So there's, there's uh, vast things that are going to happen in your life, and one of those things has to do with suffering and your identity with the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other is you're going to be glorified one day. Uh, that is the final step of salvation. Remember, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Remember, being saved from the penalty of sin, the presence of sin, is um, uh, the power of sin and the presence of sin is when we are glorified in him uh, forever. And so those are some of the things that are on his mind at this point. I love Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, um, and I think I have this on the thing. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do uh, and do count them at, but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteous the righteousness which is of God by faith. In verse ten, is where I want to get to, that I may know Him, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection. The word "know" is the word "gnosko." And it, it means to experience the same thing. He says that I may know him, I may experience the th same things that he experienced. That I may know him in a very true way because of the experience or the shared experience that I have with Christ. And I'm going to, I'm going to experience him in three ways. The power of his resurrection. His resurrection power is what frees you from the penalty of sin. His resurrection power is what erases the debt of sin from our life. And then that I may uh, have the fellowship of his sufferings. And we'll talk about that more uh, beginning next week. And that I may become formable to his death. And so uh, these, these are the things uh, that, that God uh, is doing in the life of his people uh, through uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uh, has um, uh, called us to... Uh, a new relationship with him. The Holy Spirit has uh, called us into um, the shared experiences with him as well. And the Holy Spirit uh, has given us um, the uh, erasure or the forfeiture of our debt. And uh, so those are wonderful things. Uh, as we began this morning, living for Christ, living for Christ or living the Christian life is should be the priority, the most important thing in our life. It should be. It should be the most important thing in our life. And remember Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, verse that I think each of us should memorize. I am crucified with Christ. I learned it, ne nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the faith, I live by the power of God who loved me and gave himself Amen. So I encourage you to memorize that. If you don't do anything else from what we talked about that, memorize that passage. Begin to focus on that passage. And since God has called us uh, to allow Christ to live through us, the Spirit of God to uh, direct us and to guide us and to live by the Spirit, it's important for us to discuss what it means to live by faith, to live by faith by the Spirit. Let's review. Here's the things that we're talking about in Romans 7 and 8. The first is, I can do nothing to bring spiritual maturity to my life. The law can't do anything to bring spiritual maturity to me. There's only one way to become spiritually 
successful or sanctified, and that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian is free from condemnation. There's no, no penalty for our sin. He took the penalty. The Christian has a new life or a new law, if you will, a new rule to live by, and it is the law of the Spirit. The Christian's mind must be focused on the Holy Spirit. The Christian is free from debt to sin, uh, to death, and to the devil. He's not in debt to any of those. They have no power over him. The Christian has a new life in Christ. It's in the Spirit. And he's able to uh, live that life only in the Spirit. And the Christian life is identified with Christ in the Spirit. So today, just like the Lord Jesus, we can call God. So let's allow our daddy to utilize the spirit to make us all that he's called us to be. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for your great love for us. And Father, now as we come into your presence uh, to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us, on the cross that translates into every moment of every day that we live. Father, we, we owe you our life. We owe you our eternity. And yes, we're not in debt to the law and we're not in debt to sin. But certainly we're debtors to Christ. <laughs> Amen. We, we owe you. And we can never pay you because it's free. We thank you that you have done all these things for us with an open hand, giving us life eternal. And so as we prepare this morning for the table, we ask, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, prepare our hearts in our Savior's name.